Hello, world. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning, depending on where you are. On this fast forward planet, still wrapped in a pandemic. I'd like to think that that isn't the case anymore. I have friends who have been who have died. I have countless friends and colleagues who have been affected one way or the other, uh, either through their loss of work or through loss of health, or uh, simply the stress of the disruptions that have taken place on this planet last year. And it's been about a year since this virus um, jumped the biological tracks uh, somewhere in China. Still not quite clear how that happened, but it did happen and it was inevitable, uh, whether it was there or elsewhere. And we're still struggling with this systemic reality that the world is connected in ways that hadn't been the case uh, 50 years or 100 years ago. Uh, usually uh, you were subject to disasters that were a function of something right around you, an earthquake, sometimes a volcano, like the Tambora would erupt in 1815 in the Philippines, in uh, Indonesia, and, and transform planetary agriculture and the like. But mostly our, our systems have been local, and now we're global. And whether it's your food or your climate, uh, everything around us is interlinked. So today we're going to be talking with Ruth DeFries, a great colleague of mine here at Columbia at the Earth Institute. Uh, she's a university professor, which is a rare uh, accolade here, just a few of them. And that befits her uh, diversity. Ruth is a uh, is a polymath in many ways. Uh, she's coming on momentarily. She's stuck in a, in a webinar she can't get out of. And uh, but my 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 new friend, uh, who's been a friend on on online for longer than being new, uh, Tamara Haspel is with us from the Washington Post, where she writes the Unearth column. And she uh, is not just a writer about food and systems and and how we. Uh, get the things we need and where we go from here. She also is a practitioner. Uh, Tamar and her husband and others run a um, an oyster farm. And we, you're on Cape Cod, right? We are on Cape Cod in the beautiful waters of Barnstable Harbor is where our farm is. And it happens just luckily to be one of the premier oyster growing regions actually in the world. We don't take credit for that. It's just luck. The conditions are just perfect for growing oysters. That's amazing. So now which came first, the oystering or the writing? Well, I've been a food writer, you know, since the Pleistocene era, basically. <laughs> and uh, my husband and I left Manhattan and moved to Cape Cod and started to look around and say, OK, well, what can we do here that we couldn't do in Manhattan? And the answer is all kinds of stuff. And so we embarked on this project where we sort of got food every which way from Sunday. We you know, built a chicken coop, we learned to fish, we started hunting, we grew fruit and vegetables here, we foraged for mushrooms, we made our own sea salt. And we had friends who had an oyster farm and it was really interesting. And so Kevin, my husband, spent some time, uh, that's him right there, uh, spent some time interning on one of those farms and then we were in the right place at the right time to get a lease and so we started our own and that was, uh, it was 10 years ago now. Amazing. Well, Ruth is uh, joining us now. Uh, so hold Yay. on a second. Hey, Ruth. Hello. I'm so sorry to be a few minutes late here, but so good to be with you. Hi, Ruth. You were, you were stuck That's in traffic, are. right? <laughs> I was stuck in traffic. Perfect. The commute was just horrendous. It, it, our lives have become too ultra precise these days anyway. <laughs> really? It's like, oh, now that it can be down to the atomic clock second, you have to be in a room and right at that moment. So it's great that you're here now. Um, we were just starting out by talking about a uh, food system, in this case, mariculture. I grew up in Rhode Island, uh, clamming and oystering when I could find them and not, not growing them in a systematic way, but just loving the marine environment. I, I still gravitate toward um, hydroponics, aquaponics, mm -hmm. uh, with students at Pace University 10, almost 10 years ago, did a film on shrimp aquaculture innovations in Belize. So there's something about that that captures me completely. And before we get into Ruth's book, uh, just Tamara, Tamar, a little bit more on uh, you know how that shapes how you write and how you think even about food. It absolutely does because you know even though there's so many differences between oyster farming and, and a lot of the farming that happens here and around the world, you know, I've stood on a cornfield in Iowa with a guy who farms thousands of acres of corn and soy. And we actually have a lot in common. We know what it's like, you know, to lose a crop 
to weather or disease. Um, we understand that you're sort of at the mercy of what goes on outside and you do your best to manage it. Um, and we also know the, the deep satisfaction of growing food for people. And um, it, it, it's non-trivial. There have been times when Kevin and I have been sitting, eating our own dinner in our own house and thinking about the people who are in restaurants eating the oysters that we grew. And um, it, it connects me to food production in a very visceral and also dirty, heavy, repetitive, dangerous kind of way. But that's a reminder of what has to go into this gargantuan job we have of feeding, you know, 7 billion people. Amazing. Well, I can personally attest that Tamar's oysters are delicious. <laughs> <laughs> We've shared them several times. Yes. So, Ruth, uh, your book, uh, you know, I, I have the big ratchet back on my shelves here and I've followed your work for a long time, and I thought a really good way to start here uh, before we dive into um, uh, what would nature do is just a quick sketch of how you became who you are now. You have this very, uh, eclectic isn't quite the right word, but you've been navigating through disciplines, knitting them together, whether it's working on the ground in India or using satellite imagery in the Amazon in Indonesia. So just give us a quick sketch of how that all came together. Well, that was a very nice way of saying scattered and fragmented. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I come from a geography background and geography is such an amazing uh, way of discipline, if you can call it that, because it is really such a integrated way of looking at the world. Geography is all about human and in environment and humans and nature together. So I'm very fortunate. I'm not sure how I stumbled into it, but having that kind of background from geography, which many people think is about memorizing the names of state capitals, but it's not, it's so much more. It's about how, uh, how humans and nature interact. So I just feel fortunate that I had that kind of perspective and great mentors who, who encouraged that confusing way of, but ultimately I think correct way of looking at the world that humans and nature are just so, uh, so intertwined. And I don't know any other way to look at it. So, you know, I started out working with, um, you know, on the research side, working out, working with satellite data and looking very top down at the world and, uh, and more and more getting into place and the specifics of place and Again, I'm very lucky to be able to work and live in, in India, which has given me so many um, insights into the reality on the ground of how people live with nature in rural India and uh, all the connections to markets and to, uh, it, it's such a complicated, complex systems, which I think made me comfortable with complexity. And that's what The Big Ratchet is about. And that's what this book, What Would Nature Do? is really about complex systems. Yeah, and uh, there's a section of the book that, I've, that I know you wrote at the very end because I remember reading a, a draft of the book um, before lockdown, before the virus. And uh, in the introduction, you noted uh, the coronavirus confirms that we are all connected in an, in an entangled complex maze of animals, airplanes, econo economies. This is the reality of our modern civilization. Never before has our species been so connected across the continents huddled never more we huddled in cities dependent on traded traded goods epidemics have plagued humanity since civilization began but now of course it's all super linked the the thing that struck me so hard i remember in april was the first headline i saw that showed that um yanomami indians in the amazon were getting sick from this virus that had emerged a year well as we know a year ago right around now in in the wuhan area of china and it had gone through the system, through Europe, through Americas, and ended up in Amazonia, in a country that was largely, of course, because of its leadership, ignoring this, uh, killing some of the most isolated peoples on the planet. So boy, you can't get any more hyper-connected than that. Really, so that is just the, the connected world we live in. Whereas if we have, as we have had many, many times, these sorts of uh, 
diseases emerge, but they would die out before they got the chance to become pandemics. But now we're so connected that a microscopic virus can can make it around the world. And it's funny you say that, Andy, because I know, and thank you for reading some early drafts of the of the book and Tamar as well provided some really, really useful input. Uh, I finished the book. I've been writing the book over the last five, six years and I had finished it before the pandemic and I was sending in, literally sending in the final manuscript that week in March when everything started to uh, shut down. And it was a little bit eerie because the book is about connectedness. Right. Uh, and, uh, and I scrambled to add what you just re read and to add some little pieces in uh, into the book about the pandemic. But, uh, but it was uh, kind of ironic. But, but as you say in the book, and as it's clear, you know, setting aside pathogenicity, the climate system is another thing that connects everybody and has its own unique dimensions of, that make it a very hard problem. Uh, and even cyber risk now has that same dimensionality. It's, yeah. it's an emergent system we don't really understand very well. And it's incredibly consequential because it's filtering everything we're saying right now is going out to people or being ignored by them depending on their predispositions. Right. So, so are, you, do, you start to kind of zoom in on some general principles in the book. General, well, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say that the climate system is is that uh, example of how another reason why we are in this very uncertain world is so connected. The emissions we put up into the atmosphere mix and affect everybody, but so do the consequences of climate change. So there's some parts of the book about the uh, the global food trade system and what happens when there's a a drought or a climate extreme in one part of the world that ricochets throughout the food system and ends up in food riots and geopolitics. So we're, the climate connects us in, in both in terms of its impact and in terms of its consequences. And it's got these weird aspects like the time lag you can't, there's no vaccine for climate change. Yeah. And even, even of course with the pandemic, the vaccine is still only one approach. It, it's not like we all get this vaccine and then magically sit back and hop into our airplanes again and breathe on each other again, thinking this isn't going to reemerge in some way or other. Yeah. So that's how the, that's in the first chapter of the book about how we're so used to thinking about the world as a clockwork system. This comes from all of our really amazing technological advances from the 20th century vaccines and producing so much food and synthetic fertilizer and all of these technological solutions which make us think that we have these this clockwork you can turn the clock and uh and and have these solutions and then the problem is is solved but what we're seeing from this connectedness uh is that reality is so much more complex can i ask you about that with regard to food systems because one of the things that happens and of course i write for a general interest audience and everybody eats so it, there's almost like a disconnect between what you're talking about, the idea that this is really, really complex, and the fact that it boils down to the most elemental basic thing that we all do, which is eat. And so I think people sort of expect climate to be complicated, to be complex, and I should be careful about complicated versus complex. Um, but food, there's there's a whole, there's an impulse to be reductive about food. And so many of the, the solutions that have been floated for some of the problems in our food supply read like black and white. Okay, if we graze cattle in this particular way, we will sequester carbon. If we do no-till, we will sequester carbon, we will do a bunch of other things, we will build soil. And yet when these things get tested out, um, it's way more complex than that. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And it's dependent on all of these factors. How can we expect people to make decisions about something as basic as what they eat while trying to take these things into account and being planet minded? Yeah. So just thinking about the 
how complicated <laughs> what ends up in your plate is if you just think about your next meal and try to trace back where every ingredient in your meal, where it came from, <laughs> and then start to think about where the energy came from to cook your meal and where the wastes go from, you know, your, your uh, compost goes, for, goes to. So it's pretty, you get pretty quickly to understand what a complicated set of interactions uh -huh. are involved with just what ends up on your plate for an everyday dinner. Um, and so, that's the other oyster farmer in the background, by the way. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, and actually, I, I remember uh, there was a significant early pulse of people saying, "Oh, oyster farming, it's great; it's sequestering carbon." But then Ken Caldera, who's a, a, a climate scientist with a very good chemistry background, was saying, "No, actually, it doesn't." Uh, so you, that's that point you were making earlier. What, what's interesting about this is it's not just the individual farmer, but this relates to the Paris Agreement or under the Biden administration. How much credit do you give farmers for a certain practice? And I've seen this phenomenon play out over at least more than a decade. When I was reporting on the climate bill in 2009, the political ecosystem says to get a climate bill, you got to get farmers on board. The science said, well, you know, soil's complicated. Actually, there was a guy in the Midwest who was showing you that erosion is actually sequestering carbon because you're taking soil off the field and putting it into the bed of a stream that ends up going down into the into the earth. So it gets really complicated there too. This is this is a policy question, not just the, even an individual kind of farmer yeah. question. And as Tamar was saying also, people like a simple solution, do this, do that. Uh, but there's also values that come into it. So there are certain scientific facts, like how much does oyster farming actually sequester carbon? That might be a scientific fact, but there's also uh, values and that the, all the science in the world is not going to help you make your value judgments. Do you value uh, supporting your local economy and your local oyster farmer over reducing your carbon footprint, if that's the trade-off? So there are just so many trade-offs that it's hard to quantify what they all are, but even if we knew what they all are, there's still values that come to the table. Did you see that question come across the transom there, Ruth? Oh, no, I'll put it back. That. Yeah, hold on. Put it's it back. Jo Joanne McGarry. We have this conversation all the time. <laughs> oh, that's such a complicated question, Joanne. <laughs> right. There's no simple solution to the complexity. I know. Well, and the way I look at that is is, well, if just take it back to the basic principles. What is it about the landscape around you in the Hudson Valley or in Joanne's, uh, she's in Humboldt County in California, Northern California. What is it that you value? And then how, what choices do you make that can enhance that value? And if it's sustaining regional agriculture because it's sustaining a landscape you care about, to me, that way outweighs the climate question. So yeah. then just scratch off the climate question and say, this is about the land and the community I want, which includes farmers at a farmer's market. Or There, there are basic principles that can start to sort of simplify some of those yeah. answers. But I there's think. no right or wrong to that question. So it, you oh, might exactly. value the regional economy, somebody else might value their, their carbon footprint and both are valid and you can't say one is better than the other. Yeah, let's get back to the book. Uh, there are these, um, even let's talk about the title. What would nature do? This, you know, when I was in college, learning about evolution and, and the like, I was hammered into me that nature doesn't care. Nature is not purposeful. Nature, the the, the dynamics of the ecosystems and the individual species evolved through this wacky set of mistakes, um, and we do look to it for lessons, and they're there. But is it is there a risk in? Well, I'm sure I know in the book you always, you make the point that nature isn't teaching us a lesson. It's not purposeful. There are patterns and the like. So how, how important is it for us to step back and just be remind ourselves that the, the patterns and the resilience that we see in nature was actually not managed or designed? Oh. Yep, uh, are we there? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I hope that the title doesn't, I actually worried about this a little bit with the title that it's uh, about 
the possible interpretation that nature is doing something intentional. And uh, as you said, nature is not intentional by design or nature doesn't care about us <laughs> or have any particular future plan in mind. It's, uh, it's trial and error and what works, what survives, that's, uh, that's what goes on to live another day. So uh, it, the, the point of the book is that over time, because nature has survived through so many, uh, so many uncertainties and perturbations like extinctions and asteroids and volcanic emissions and swings in climate and all of these uncertainties, over time, nature unintentionally with no purpose, no design, uh, has developed these strategies to persist through uncertainty. Not because that's good or because that's right, or that's because it's the way it should be, but because that's what works. That's what has enabled life to, uh, life to persist. So the idea of the book is how do, how do we learn, not that nature is trying to teach us, but how do we learn from those strategies which have enabled nature to persist for billions of years. And, and Ruth, again, not Ruth, um, Tamar, keep some questions in mind. And, and if, you know, what comes to mind for, from you is, as well in terms of answers is, is important here. The, um, and this gets to this next issue or question, which is what do we, what do we work on? This is, you know, to me, I, I had this, for 30 years as a climate-focused journalist and sustainability-focused, I was thinking about surrounded by numbers. We need to cut emissions 80% by 2050 or the like. You see that all the time. We're losing X number of species. And I kept thinking, well, in this world that's so complex then, if you know you don't know how to like design a top-down system, you know, a target set by the UN that we all abide by, that's not gonna work then what do you design? What do you work on? And I started to think, well, you work on system properties, right? Which give you, you being humanity, that playing space, the running space to be yourself, to be different, to be diverse. And I think that this comes through in your book too, for sure. It's, um, it's not like we're gonna sit back and design a, a leaf, meaning design a system that has the resilience of how a leaf sends its nutrients around. But you can design so that leafism can arise in, in a human system, which takes me back to your work on the ground in India. Or, you know, I've been in favelas in Brazil where they function. They like function. They have their own governance, their own yeah. systems. You might not like who's running that system sometimes if it's a drug dealer, but there is an innate capacity to have a system that sort of works. Is that part of what one of the key lessons is here? Yeah, that's part of what I've learned from India is complexity. It seems like, how can this go? How, how can this function? But it does because of the complexity and the diversity. Uh, but you know, if only we were smart enough to design a leaf vein or design some centralized economy, but we're not. And I think we've proven that to ourselves over and over again that that in when you have a complex systems which means you can't really predict the outcome of any any uh perturbation or it's very but, hard to predict then oh, sorry yeah then uh then how do we how do we instead of thinking how do we design to what are the properties that we can build in that will enable us to persist through uncertainty. So that's where the leaf vein learning evolution, I'm not going to say learning, but evolution uh, evolved to have a strategy which enables a leaf vein to be resilient to getting a bite taken out of it or being torn by having a redundant leaf vein network. So how do we take that kind of learning into our the networks that we create with our trade and supply chains and all of the networks that keep civilization functioning. So it's Tamar, those systems level properties. And Tamara, I think you had a thought. Yeah, I did. Too. Cause I, so I was in, I was in Kansas um, 
two years ago, I guess. And I went to, and I've told Ruth about this visit. I went to the Land Institute, which is where they're developing perennial grains. They're working on Kernza, um, which is the most famous, but they're also working on uh, sorghum and rice, which has been the biggest success so far. And and they're modeling. So we there, there's a strip of land. It's just a, a few acres, I think, out by the Land Institute that, according to records, has never been plowed. It's virgin prairie. And it's this this tangle of different kinds of plants of different heights. They flower at different times and they all coexist in this this way. And, you know, when the Land Institute is trying to develop these perennial grains, they talk about using them um, uh, intercropping them with legumes because they're looking to mimic the way that the, the, the prairie had developed. And, and Fred Utzi there, who was the president at the time, made the point that we're not mimicking the prairie because it's natural. We're mimicking it because it's successful. And one of the things that I wonder about is that, okay, well, some of the same things, I mean, Nate, I like it. the point that you made that nature doesn't design this. This is essentially one grand scheme of trial and error, <laughs> and and the errors die off, and and the things that work perpetuate. And in some ways, human systems are the same way, where we try all kinds of things, and the things that aren't successful die away, and hopefully we come up with ways that are successful. Um, but we're this is this is a way almost of trying the very act of taking nature strategies that are a result of trial and error and imposing them. I don't know what the question is here, but it was the thing that I was thinking about as you were talking, that we're trying to not do trial and error. We're trying to do our better trial and error to try and, and not fail so often or so spectacularly, but it's still got to be hard. Yeah. But, you know, if we have a couple of billion years from now, if human civilization is still around, we'll probably be pretty good, pretty good at figuring out how to persist through shocks and all of the things that trouble our civilization now. It's just over time. So that's what I found so interesting when I was working on this book was that um, there are examples. I found these examples and they're in the book about where these strategies that we might attribute to nature's trial and error process have actually, people have realized that they work, even though they might fly against efficiency. And for example, uh, everybody knows about diversified portfolios for your investments. So, you know, that idea didn't really come around until the 1950s with Paul Markowitz. Uh, and that's the idea. You give up some short term gains to have a longer term stability in uh, in the investment. So so th those kinds of examples, redundancy in engineering. I came across a, a, a couple of examples where uh, those strategies of nature were actually taken on, although those people, I'm sure, didn't realize that they were mimicking a leaf vein or <laughs> or the prairie diversity, but came came to understand that those are the strategies that uh, that will be successful over the long term. So, yeah, and, and what you were describing there about the investment strategy is it really is like the same inefficiency diversity idea. But we're so we've been so stuck on that other model for decades. I've had several sessions on here early on, uh, Kate Rayworth, who's come up with donut economics, sort of a circular economics, uh, and Herman Daly, the father of ecological ec economics on here. We were, I kept, I kept asking this question. Okay, we've had this huge shock. Everything's broken for the moment. All of our norms, the plains that crisscross the Hudson Valley are still not back anywhere where they were. Ken, is this an opportunity to build forward in a new way? And then I keep coming up against the, the old pattern. Even Biden, for all the merits of what's coming with his new administration, it's build back better. It's not build forward. Build back better, you know, politically, all we want to do is go back to what we were doing. Get maybe, but so Ruth, Ruth I don't know, in looking, 
and what you learn through the book writing and what you're seeing around you, um, are we in danger of just building back? Building or, back the same? Yeah, or maybe not quite the same. Well, a that's the human the human way is always to not to do it not quite the same, maybe a little less worse. Yeah. Well, the human way is to think short term. That's just I think comes from our evolution, I suppose. Um, but uh, I was on a webinar earlier this morning, and uh, there was discussion about the uh, pharmaceuticals and the supply chain for pharmaceuticals that are so important for uh, for treating COVID. Uh, and discussion about how how kind of sole sourced those pharmaceuticals are coming from just a few places. Oh gosh. What? Did we lose you? Am I back? I hear yeah. you. Yeah. Um, it, just coming from a, a few places, China and India, where the production is happening and how that's causing real um, shortages. So that's pretty serious stuff. And that is a, a such a learning opportunity or implementing the, the learning about how dangerous it is to have supply chains that are um, that are not redundant that don't have some kind of redundancy and some kind of backup. So, you know, th those really serious uh, impacts of not following these strategies from nature, you know, as they, as they affect our daily lives, I think mm -hmm. people will learn. I mean, people have adapted, people are very adaptable and ingenious and, and learn when it's to, to our benefit. But there's also a, a tendency and a temptation to be reductive and this you know from this comes the idea that things that are natural are inherently better than things that are not natural and certainly when we talk about food systems that that happens a lot and you know Joanne asked the question earlier about whether uh, seasonal organic local um, addresses this issue and and it's I think it's hard for for people and sometimes it's hard for me to wrap your mind around the fact that we're looking at natural uh, strategies that come from nature, but we're applying them to modern industrial systems. We're not rolling back, as you were talking about, to you know a pre-industrialized way of producing food and probably other things as well. Um, that that progress and modernity and industrialization aren't necessarily bad. We just need to learn them. To, to do better, but that's a very hard conversation to have. Yeah, it, that's such a hard, I mean, what is natural? I mean, right. is it natural to live in a house? Is it natural to go to the store and buy your food? Not really. Um, and right now my natural light is probably driving everything that's because yeah, the sun good. is going behind clouds and coming down. Yeah, so, you know, we do, I don't think we'd want to eat Teosinte on the cob, you know, the, the crop wild relative for, for um, corn or try to put a wild tomato in our salad. Um, so, you know, we're already, I mean, that's just so, we're so beyond what we might think of as, as natural. I, just this morning, I was tweeting about something I wrote about way back in 2008, which was Singapore just approved for the first time uh, lab grown meat to be sold in restaurants. It's uh, chicken nuggets. Um, and th that's one approach. The other approach is the plant based substitutes like impossible foods, uh, which I recently interviewed Pat Brown on here. And I, I think this is a case where the potential is there f always for a hybrid approach here. You know, I think some people will always crave something that's really like a piece of meat, um, at least through the lifetimes of people who are who are alive today. But you can have other things that emerge that become normal, unremarkable even. That, that. So I, I that gives me hope. And I, I think uh, I find your book hopeful in that you're describing sort of the potential to tend, tend a garden of opportunity and things can burst forth as, as long as we sort of insulate against the real hard knocks that we do have the potential in our human diversity and which exists both geographically and culturally to work through where we're at right now. Is that, is that 
when you think about the book and you think about where we are today, do you feel worried or hopeful or sort of a mix? What, what, what's the yeah. feeling? No, thanks, Andy. I do mean it to be hopeful. And that's the way I meant the big ratchet also to be hopeful about how, uh, how much potential the human species has to learn and how much we've accomplished. Look at the reduction in poverty. I know it's gone up and is going up and that's very worrisome, but over the, the, decadal kind of time scale. Look at the reduction in poverty, the increase in uh, life expectancy, the decrease in infant mortality. All of these, these achievements are just really a testament to our ingenuity. So how do we now take that ingenuity and, and use it in a way that allows us to go forward when we are facing this very uncertain world, uncertain because of climate change, uncertain because of these this connectedness where a, a virus can ricochet around the world. Uh, can I piggyback on on that point about uh, the new kinds of of both cultured and plant based meats? Because I think that's where it, it's sort of a flashpoint for the some of the the arguments about the role of of naturalness versus natural strategies in food because the, you know on the one hand you have okay here's technology and ingenuity which are specifically uh out there to address issues of climate change but there are lots of people who are pushing back on that and saying well you know what's more natural um, what system can we trust these big factories with the big vats or the cows on the grass? And, you know, obviously in lots of ways, the cows on the grass and the equilibrium that, that, that they reached when, you know, the bison roamed the plains um, is, is a natural system that now we're specifically trying to circumvent by doing th with this technological solution. So it seems that these ideas are almost in tension on this issue. Yeah, Ruth, I'm sure you come across this over and over and over again, these sort of fights between simplistic categories, techno-optimists, and and uh, those looking for social cues and social solutions. Um, what do you think about, is, is it necessary to resolve that, or do we just work with that fact that there'll always be these bifurcations? And if it's necessary to resolve it, we're totally screwed. Yeah, I know. yeah. I just think we have to live with the idea that different people have different values and, and that there, there's really um, trying to expect rationality is, is probably irrational. That <laughs> um, there's such an important cultural component to what people like and what they like to eat. And, and that's, that's valid. It's valid if if it's culturally important to people to eat, um, you know, grass-fed meat rather than plant-based something from a vat. Then you know that's their cultural values. So mm -hmm. that's that's valid. The place that this gets tricky is in the policy arena when people are fighting for government, like in the United States. Um, it's the hundred percent renewable crowd versus, or, or do you call it clean energy standards or renewable energy standards? In other words, boxing out nuclear, for example, where, where and these fights are, they're not quite to the death, but they are just like, it, it's always about your niche or your, when you're fighting for some chunk of a piece of legislation, these fights seem to get to be really poisonous where you have people who are all, all working toward the same end, you know, a safe relationship with climate. They're so focused on their niche that they just kind of lose that sense of the merits of having that diversity. If, if that yeah. that that drives me crazy. Uh, Ruth, so are there, this, there... Uh, that, so yeah, this another principle from from nature is the value of diversity, which not only includes the diversity of plants and seeds and and uh, you know ecological diversity, but also the diversity of uh, of worldviews and different cultural values and how that just makes us all richer and a larger, bigger library to draw on. I have to show something that was part of my learning curve on this. Um, around 2011, I was writing about the um, Keystone Pipeline. That was when it became an issue for Obama, the, the liberal left and the climate movement 
was trying to force Obama right at a point when he was trying to get reelected to take a hard stance on the pipeline. And I was saying, you know, I was being very macroeconomic. I was talking about, well, you know, as long as oil is, uh, demand is high, people are going to want it from somewhere. So it's going to come, if not through that pipeline, another one. And this fight, it was just this big fight. Bill McKibben, who's a good friend, but he was very pissed at me for uh, saying something, you know, that was rational technically when it was all about stopping the pipeline. And I started Googling for like words. I was literally searching for diversity responses to the environmental movement. Can it tolerate diversity? And the thing I came up with is this paper from 2003 from Tom Elmquist, who I know you know, mm -hmm. and Gary P Peters and others uh, on, on this finding in nature that like in nature, the resilience of an ecosystem is substantially determined by the species, the response, the, the diversity of responses to a stress. So it's not so much the diversity of species, it's the, it's the diversity of ways in which a species in a certain niche of the ecosystem responds. And that was like mind blowing to me because, and I immediately thought about it in the context of um, social um, systems. So. I, I, I use this on my blog at one point, you know, if you just move that the diversity of responses to environmental change among people contributing to the same social function, let's call it response diversity is critical to resilience. And so like, this is so rational, right? It's, we don't want all to be like a lemming marching off the cliff in one direction. We, we know through, through history, if we were all like camped by the fire and no one was stupid enough to go over the ridge, as as a as a group, that that village wouldn't have prospered more, but we just don't seem to be able to do it in day to day life. Like, how do you how do you embrace the diversity and still seek your part of it? Yeah. So I think Tamar could probably speak to this, but people will. It's so it's so uh, tempting to have a yes or no, all or nothing kind of view, like all industrial farming is bad or you know, all smallholder farming is good and just try to try to have a simple answer. But in reality, it's the diversity and the mix of different food production systems which enable enable us to the food system to feed humanity. I would like to invoke another principle from the book on this one because you know, as we've been talking about diversity of responses, diversity of, of, of human reactions and how humans work together. Um, but the very first chapter in your book is about circuit breakers. And so here we've gotten to this point, and I'm stepping way out of food systems at this point, but we've gotten to this point where we have this, this sort of toxic partisanship and it doesn't just happen politically i mean i would say that there's toxic partisanship on on the idea of plant-based meat there's toxic partisanship on genetic modification there's toxic partisan partisanship about all of these agricultural issues which are just a microcosm of toxic partisanship do we have any circuit breakers for that how can <laughs> we as humans sort of say okay well when this diversity stops being constructive and starts being destructive. Is there any way we can pull the plug? Because that's, that is the strategy that you lead off with in the book. Yeah. Well, so Ruth, the circuit, Ruth, Ruth, yeah. But before you answer, I have to point out that a, that a comment just came in literally uh, from Science Cathedral on YouTube saying, is it bad for science to pretend it can parse the complexity of natural and social systems and at the same time, allow itself to be usurped and abused for political manipulation, mm. obfuscation, and oppression, which is so resonant with what Tamar just said. Yeah, it sure is. So uh, we just had a circuit breaker on November 3rd or whenever this election will <laughs> be over. Not, not that we want to take this this uh, session into political territory, but uh, but circuit breaker is the idea that we all learned about at the in the pandemic in the in the uh, stock market that if there's a crash that happens too fast then it's uh it's the uh it's what regulators devised which actually mimics the self-regulating processes in nature to pause stabilize the market and prevent a, a more drastic crash so that didn't go in until black monday 
which I think was 1987, when, uh, when the regulators uh, came up with this idea. Again, not, not cognizant of, of nature's many <laughs> self-regulating processes, but that idea of how to have some automated circuit breaker. So this happened in March and April again and again and again as the stock market was, was falling. And, and, and um, elections are kind of the same idea. If they, well, you know, if, if, if they the go the way they're supposed holds up yeah. to the stock, yeah. right? Which it it's has super so interesting because my husband, who now is an oyster farmer, but worked as a commodity trader in New York on the floor yeah. trading. And the transition from open outcry trading, where there are actual people in the ring doing this, to online was, was difficult for some of those same reasons, because there were long standing limits. On um, on commodity prices that you had to halt the market as soon as they hit this limit up or down, but it took a long time to 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 get these same kinds of circuit breakers in automated systems. And you well, know what? Yeah. This one other th one other thing comes to mind, and this comes from another colleague and friend at Columbia, Peter Coleman who runs uh, the Difficult Conversations Laboratory, yeah. which I feel is one of the most needed yeah. structures I know of right now on so Can many you come levels. To my house? <laughs> yeah, I know, oh, exactly. You give him some oysters. <laughs> He's the most <laughs> wonderful person. I've done sessions. We're gonna do another one next week. Uh, I'm starting a series on this, pod, this webcast called Difficult Conversations. But he talks about circuit breakers in discourse, You know, knowing when you're getting to that brittle point at the scale of either a negotiation over Middle East peace or the scale of a household over who cleans the kitchen, uh, that that circuit breaker concept uh, seems to be really fundamentally needed. Well, it is pervasive in nature from the way that insulin, blood sugar is regulated in the body. That's a self-regulating uh, feedback system between our hormones. Uh, all the way to that physiological level, all the way up to the global scale cycling of carbon in and out of the atmosphere, which is depends on uh, uh, temperature and self-regulate so that that the uh, amount of carbon in the atmosphere stays within uh, some guardrails. It varies, but stays within some guardrails. So nature is full, full of these self-regulating, self-correcting kinds of uh, mechanisms and that so and we're learning that building it yeah. into the the Could I uh, financial system and and Peter building it into uh, conflict resolution. So the the story one of the stories that I love from the book is the biosphere and the idea that you know they had circuit breakers, but it, it, again we've got this 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 separation between natural systems and human interaction and they didn't have circuit breakers for the human interaction part and eventually that was the thing that sort of doomed the project i don't know because it's fascinating to me i, I would love for you to talk just a little bit about it well this is the the biosphere two in the sonoran desert in arizona which is such an amazing place if, if anyone gets a chance to go there um and that was the attempt in the uh, 80s to build a closed ecosystem and have eight people, biospherians, live in there for two years and grow all their own food, recycle their waste, get all their water from recycling. So they had their different, the different ecosystems and they brought in thousands of species and, uh, and they had some real problems. Uh, they couldn't produce enough food and they didn't have enough oxygen, but they made it, they survived for two years. Uh, so that was the first pass in Biosphere 2. Learned a lot, but but made it. The second pass, another seven Biospherians went in and uh, they didn't make it for the two years, not because they didn't have enough food or the oxygen ran out, but because, they, because of management, human management and uh, cost overruns. And finally the, uh, the feds came in and it's a very dramatic story. But uh, point being, as Tamar said, that it was really the human foibles in the end that, uh, that uh, got Biosphere 2 to not achieve its two-year second round of two-year objective. 
That's so interesting. Yeah, we we need. By the way, we're planning a session in January on the film about Biosphere Two. I'll show just while we're talking. Uh, I'll show a little bit of that. Yeah, I'm fascinated by that. I can't wait to see it. You can take was, tours. It, I did that recently. A, a bizarre <laughs> social experiment, no, for sure. A amazing. Um, so um, let, let's, and then the conclusions of the book. We're, we're getting here toward the last uh, minutes, last 10 minutes or so. So when you think of a key uh, takeaway, especially a friend of mine, Jer Jeremy Zalar, who was on the show the first day, way back in March and Sunday, he encourages everyone to think, you know, what's something we could do next week or tomorrow even that can incrementally concretize one of the visions that's uh, in the book, besides getting more people to read it. Uh, you know, we're building a climate school at Columbia. Uh, I'm working with the media. Uh, we're doing journalism training around how do you write about resilience when the media really just write about events still mostly. We don't write about systems. It's really hard to do that, especially yeah. in constrained. Good luck with that. <laughs> no, no, especially in constrained. Somebody who's been trying to do it for a long time. It's well, just, it's hard oh, enough at the Washington Post and out. the New York Times. It's hard enough at the Times or the Post, but you know, if you're at, at the Cleveland paper right. or a you know, place mm -hmm. that's just, just, how do you cover wildfire risk uh, at a small paper in America's wildfire zones uh, in a way that isn't just waiting for the fire and then saying, oh my God, look what happened and look what burned. Uh, those are really opportunities. So, so maybe if each of you could think of some one or two things that could take this forward a notch, that'd be cool. Ruth, when you when you think back about the yeah. lessons in the book, yeah. So I thought about that a lot when writing the book because I know people like to know, to think about you know have concrete. What can they do tomorrow? What can they do in their lives? Uh, and um, and the book is really more about how we think about the governance and the systems that we we live in. So I, I can't, if there's anybody who is expecting from the book, you know, I'm gonna do this X tomorrow and it's going to, to change the world. I'm, I'm afraid they might be disappointed, but it's more, how do we think about the way we organize ourselves and our institutions to um, be beyond kind of short-term thinking to be uh, to go beyond uh, the paradigm of efficiency that we're all so comfortable with, and what kinds of um, leaders do we support? What kinds of bottom-up activities can we en engage in ourselves in our communities that build on the idea of bottom-up? Um, and how do we organize our thinking about the society that we? live in. So the book is more about those kinds of systems level, um, how we construct our human affairs than about uh, individual action. Not that, not that um, it's not important to think about what we all do as individuals, but what we all do as individuals in society. And, and tomorrow, from your standpoint, both as an oyster producer and a writer, um, what would a an ideal situation look like in thirty or forty years? Uh, you know, in terms of how people think about food and get get it, and how people who create food uh, do their part. I, well, I think that it's going to require us to to think about food differently from the way that we're thinking about it now, and and. You know, when I go places and talk about food systems and their impact on climate change, lots and lots of people are interested in the minutia. But I think the 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 body of people they they just want to know what to eat, and we've been so focused on a few things that have captured people's imagination: um, plant-based meats, cell-based meats. Um, people have rallied around issues of monocultures and GMOs. Um, uh, uh, greenhouses and vertical farms. And the reality is that the thing that has the most impact on our food system is, is staple crops. They make up the bulk of people's diets, they take up the bulk of the land, but we don't talk much about those. And, um, and I think we need to, to move away. I mean, the vegetables and the meats are the, are the high charisma foods. 
but it's the grains, it's the oats, it's the millet, it is the corn where it's eaten as corn and not fed to animals or, or turned into fuel. Um, uh, legumes, uh, tubers, sweet potatoes, potatoes, breadfruit, banana, jackfruit, those kinds of things. The, these are the bulk of a food system that, that is, is healthy for both people and planet but they interest almost nobody. Right. <laughs> and so, so I think we have to start thinking about the real basics of agriculture, staple crops, if we're going to start growing things better. Yeah, that seems to be a fundamental division for me. Um, when I wrote at Dot Earth over the last decade or so about food, it always came down to the right tool for the right job in the right place and the right context. And, you know, for Brazil, where I spent time when I wrote my first book and I've been back many times, a couple of times to the Amazon. If you care about the Amazon, you probably should care about intensified agriculture. In other words, do more mm -hmm. with less land. Mm -hmm. And that is, is an uncomfortable reality for, for many folks. But soy so. has to come from somewhere. And the, that leads to a, a wider sense of what nature should look like, where do you make some compromises. I want to show an image before we get to the final round of thoughts of, that are sort of forward looking and hopeful, let's. I want to show you the scale question. My my friend George Steinmetz, great aerial photographer, I teamed up with him on his latest book, uh, yeah. The Human Planet. And this is an aerial image he took off of China of what you're doing tomorrow off Cape Cod, yeah, but at China like scale. That. And it's basically okay, seafood yeah. culture to the horizon. Wow. And you can look at that and go, oh, my effing God. Yes. Oh my or you can look God. at that and go, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because oyster uh, aquaculture is one of the few ways you can grow food that has the potential, if it's done right, to, to leave the environment better than it found it. But, you know, if you're doing that kind of density and running those kinds of boats and, um, you know, I don't know the specifics of where this is and what kind of nutrient uh, flow right, to have coming yeah, into right. it, but, but yeah, well, well, always from like any other company, you can do it well and you can do it poorly and you can damage the environment or, 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 or damage it less, or even maybe have, have a good impact on it. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's scale is tough. Scale is tough. Scale is tough. But again, I, I'm, I'm still kind of an optimist. Me too. My, uh, a friend of mine the other day, I, I, I showed him a wheel of like, possible states of mind, including being really upset and optimistic. And he saw it as a clock. <laughs> like in the morning, he's optimistic. <laughs> and, and by the evening, he's totally sapped. And I think I do have some of that quality too. But so Ruth, the last word is yours, you know, going forth. Uh, folks, obviously, I, I think should read the book. But what uh, any any last thought from you on? Yeah, so I saw time lesson. Uh... I saw a question flash by about whether we're headed for oblivion or continuance. And I'll just say that it's a nature of complex systems to go through destruction and, and rebirth. And that's just the nature of, of human civilization as well as any other complex system. And we've seen that for, for 12,000 years of, of uh, human civilization. And we can expect that cycle to continue. But the question isn't, to me, it's not either or, are we, headed for oblivion or are we just fine the way we are it's more how can we learn from nature and learn from how how a complex system can persist over time and incorporate those lessons so that we can do better that we can have less hardship when we have face a shock like mm -hmm. we faced with with covid so i don't see that question as an either or i see it as a uh, incorporating learnings and adapting and using our ingenuity to um, to do better. There you go. I think that's a good place to uh, end the discussion today. It's been great to have you both here. And you know, Thank we can you for having me. You can come back anytime. This was a good start. I always see these conversations as really starting places. Not we don't get everything done in one meeting, uh, Ruth. Uh, and we should spill this into the learning here. Um, this this platform actually now is, is accessible for our students and our faculty to use to extend some particular aspect of this question, but, you know, aquaculture. We can do a session on that. We can get going forward, that kind of thing. So Sustain What, which is this, is a global online conversation identifying solutions to the complicated, shape-shifting, and epic challenges of humanity's great acceleration 
which is the ha last half century of our experience on the planet. Now we've been in a great pause enforced on us by a virus that emerged and crossed species pretty much one year ago this week, <laughs> more or less. Wow. A prime focus uh, of navigating this kind of terrain is making sense of and getting the most out of the planet's fast forward information environment. It's the one Earth system changing faster than the actual environment. This webcast is produced as part of my work building Columbia University's new Earth Institute initiative on communication and sustainability, incrementally trying to make information matter a little bit more every day. As soon as we're done, share the link you've been watching on with friends and circles far and wide. Get in touch with me with ideas for future shows. Look at that distracting little scrolling bar at the bottom to get the email address and the like. And thanks for tuning in today. And thank you. Tamar Haspel in Cape Cod on your oyster farm and at the Washington Post and Ruth DeFries in the Catskills uh, University professor at Columbia. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks. much, Andy. And come back. Okay, bye. <laughs>